Welcome everybody to the Bakey CV Live. Our topic today is atrial fibrillation and we've got an exciting program for you. It is a call-in program so if you have a question about atrial fibrillation you can call us. There are a couple ways to do this. One is on your phone and one is on your computer. We'll be showing those at the screen and I'll also go over them with you. If you're on your phone, uh, you go to the text, text message on your phone and you put in 37607. 37607. The bakey is what you put in the text box. So at the top where it says 2 you put 37607, and then where you text your message, put in DeBakey. That's D-E-B-A-K-E-Y, after Dr. DeBakey. So anytime uh, during this next 45 minutes, if you have any question, and there are no stupid questions, we take all questions, uh, and these are lay questions from our lay audience, uh, simply text us, or if you would like, you can also respond to pollev, P-O-L-L-E-V dot com, enter DeBakey, and then you can text in uh, your question or write in your question. I have two guests today. Uh, one is Dr. Swami, who's a junior uh, surgeon in our group, cardiac surgeon in our group at DeBakey. And uh, you may remember he was uh, with us uh, last month uh, Dr. Swami is a cardiac surgeon trained in, at Northwestern and uh, Stanford and Texas Heart. Other right. places, those are the main places. Uh, comes with great c credentials and he has an interest in the treatment of atrial fibrillation and joins, joins us again uh, for this month's AFib talk. Also, we have Mr. Richard Kukuk. Richard uh, is a person who suffered from AFib. He's a very thoughtful man who uh, thought about what his options were and he will share with us his thought process about what he had and what he decided to do with his atrial fibrillation. Uh, Richard and his lovely wife Linda live in Oklahoma City. Uh, his wife is a pretty famous person. Uh, she is an amazing artist uh, you may have seen her works in museums around the country. I think she's also done some Disney projects, and she's also illustrated children's books. Uh, so uh, uh, Richard uh, has been able to tag along his spouse, I think, sometimes with his, with his wife's work. But Richard has an interesting uh, story as well. So what we'd like to do this hour is take questions about AFib, number one. Number two talk to Swami and talk to Richard about AFib. And number three, go over who are candidates if you wish to know about the mini maze procedure, which we do here. And I think we do more of them than any place else in the United States or North America for sure. Uh, but we can talk about who the candidates are for mini maze for AFib if you're interested in that. <clears throat> so I'd like to first though get in, talk to Richard a little bit uh, Richard, uh, welcome to the program, and thank you so much for coming on, taking time to share your story with people that are suffering from AFib and trying to decide what to do. Uh, I'll return it over to you. Welcome to the program. Well, thank you very much for the kind comments and warm welcome. The, uh, I guess my thought process involved in what I might be able to add to this session would be, trust me, I have had experiences with my AFib that uh, anyone that has AFib and feels like they're just uh, no good answers, feels like they're on a roller coaster ride, trust me, I can relate to that very, very well. Uh, Maybe I'm not. Maybe you should go back and tell us a little bit of your story. That would help everybody I'll relate just, to you. 
I think uh, it'd be worth just kind of giving you a little timeline. Okay. And a little about uh, uh, in July of 2012, I went to take a first class uh, pilot's physical. I've been a professional pilot uh, uh, ever since uh, really all my life. Uh, at the end of my career, you know, it accumulated around 19,000 hours in over 160 countries. So lots of international flying, lots of test flying, lots of instructions, instructional flying, research flying, but also uh, was an aviation businessman in the airplane. We had an airplane dealership for about 17 years uh, in South Africa. So everything I pretty much, and also a, probably one of the larger aircraft delivery services called the, a ferry company that delivers airplanes for other people all over the world. All, everything from little single engine airplanes through uh, heavy jets and things. So anyone that is involved in an, in an endeavor uh, or a vocation that requires physical health uh, would understand that it is everything I dealt in, my entire livelihood and love of work depended on passing an FAA physical and most of the time every six months. So it's, uh, I'll just start with a timeline of how this uh, first uh, jump on the roller coaster came about. July 2012, to, went to take my uh, six months physical, laid down on the table with the EKG all hooked up to me. And, and it's uh, sent via the internet as it's being taken directly to the FIA. And the examiner, when it was over, said, I am really sorry, but you have got a blip on your EKG. And he said, I'm going to run another one just for myself to make sure uh, what I see is what it is. Well, I took a glance at it, and I could see that one little thing wasn't uh, there in the same spot every time that it always had been before. And I knew that that was where you look to see if you got AFib. And sure enough, I had AFib. So that means from that day on, I wasn't qualified to be a crew member or in command of an aircraft. So I, uh, one of my best friends uh, is a cardiologist, very highly respected cardiologist in Oklahoma. I called and I said, I've got uh, to come out and visit with you. He said, boy, let's do it. Let's go to lunch. I said, no, I need your professional skills. And he specializes in very difficult, uh, uh, and when I say difficult, the most difficult uh, stents and also uh, does a lot of pacemakers, does a lot of rhythm treatments. So he immediately uh, says, we'll try to fix you up. So we went the route most people go. I had electrocardio version. But first, uh, he immediately put me on a rhythm drug and a rate drug uh, uh, before I even was able to get to the office or to the hospital and do the uh, EC electrocardio version. And, you know, that thing worked for about two minutes. It worked. <laughs> I was back in rhythm. And he went out in the lobby and told my wife, I am really sorry, but this did not hold. And he said, it would be the rhythm or rate drugs that we're trying. So for, he for said, Richard, for those in the audience, uh, you had a cardioversion, electrical cardioversion, uh, which sort of resets the heart, tries to put the heart back in rhythm. It doesn't stop AFib overall but it can stop it for a short time, get you back in rhythm, but the underlying problem remains. And unfortunately, in a lot of people, cardioversions are not successful. Even if they are successful, sometimes it's for a day. Two minutes is pretty short time. 
But go ahead. I'm just want to make everybody clear about what we're talking about. I, re I really appreciate it. Just jump in any time because. Oh, I will. I want. <laughs> I want to be as helpful to those that are in need out there because I really know what it feels like to be in this situation. It's uh, it's a real, uh, I, I guess, a roller coaster ride. It's easy, and I'm not being critical of any of the widely accepted procedures. I'm not being critical of any specific uh, a specialty that treats uh, AFib. I know. Occasionally, people have good luck with some of those procedures. Mm -hmm. But my next thing was, he said, <coughs> I'm going to keep in the hospital here because I want to try another rhythm drug. And he said, it's one that I definitely do not go to first because it does have some significant risk, but it's really bulletproof as far as helping with the rhythm, and he said, I want to get you out of AFib as soon as possible. I don't want you to have a stroke. Uh, and I didn't want one either. So I took this drug intravenously, so it didn't take a week or two to get it up to the levels. So they can do it, get your levels up quite quickly by doing it intravenously. And it was a well-known drug, Russian drug, back come from about in the 60s. It was one of those drugs that they thought that the uh, benefits were so great that it outweighed doing long drawn out testing. So it was okay for a rhythm drug with minimal testing because it was really bulletproof as far as regulating your heart rate. It's called amiodarone. I didn't know much about it then, but I know a lot about it now and I've done a lot of research on it. And I've talked to a lot of people that have eventually had problems like I did with it. But with the amiodarone, and I don't recall which... Uh, let, let me uh, interject again, if I might. Amiodarone was never FDA approved for AFib. It was approved for life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias. That's a, an arrhythmia of the bottom chamber of the heart, not the top. So uh, a life-threatening ventricular arrhythmia is what it says, life-threatening. So any drug that would decrease the chance of of that rhythm we could get through the FDA a little bit easier, but 88% of all amiodarone, amiodarone use in the United States is for AFib, which means 88% of its use is off-label. That's exactly right, and the, uh, the drug, uh, by golly, it was a Cracker Jack, initially, drug that uh, got you back in with rhythm. Another cardio version. I did another cardio version three uh, on the third day later. My levels of amiodarone were high enough for him to try that again because he was really concerned about me being an AFib and the risk that AFib carries. And sure enough, it uh, it held, and it held for some time. But there I was with a, the only rate drug that seemed to work for me. The first one, I don't know, I, which seemed like Carvedilol was one that I'd tried, and, and they were also going to put me on a blood thinner. But the uh, amiodarone did for uh, almost two years, up until 2000, July of 2014, uh, did keep my heart regulated. But I had other problems. If the drug felt like it was absolutely going to eventually, by the, by the end of that period of time, I told uh, my cardiologist that this drug, I think, is absolute because I'm a strong person, athletic, I run. And I said between that and the and the rate drug that uh, I have to be on, I uh, the rate drug does a good job, and it does. It controls your heart rate. And a runner is not very happy with something that puts a block of wood under the accelerator pedal. 
I lost my stamina. I was beginning to have some vision problems because of the amiodarone, and I didn't realize what it was at night I was seeing because amiodarone, there's a crystallization like little particles that a good uh, 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 ophthalmologist can see with. And in fact, my ophthalmologist looked and said, are you on amiodarone now? And it makes car headlights just look like a big bright glare. Uh, Each day I felt like I was just getting more anxious and weaker and sicker. And then my uh, cardiologist said, I want to see, I want to do a, have an ultrasound and a scan and some thyroid tests ran on you. Okay, I'm going to, we're, we're going to take a short break now. And I want to mention again that if you're on your phone, you can go to 37607, 37607 and uh, text DeBakey, uh, put in the text box DeBakey, and you can ask your question, and we'll take your questions. I want to squeeze in one question right now. My question for the docs is, is regarding recent studies that seem to show a correlation with AFib and dementia. Can untreated AFib raise the risk for dementia? Well, the short answer is probably yes. Um, and it used to be said a long time ago that you have AFib, you'll just have to live with it. It's not going to shorten your lifetime and it won't, won't bother you unless you have a stroke. But now we know that's not completely true. And there are several studies that suggest there is a relationship to being out of rhythm a long time and dementia. Now, is this from little pieces of clot going into the brain? Is this because of decreased perfusion? Is this because of the drugs like amiodarone that Richard was taking that caused this? Or is it a combination of those three and others? We're not sure, but an interesting story is a neuroradiologist from Texas Heart had AFib, and he said, I can tell on the CT scans, he reads head CTs all day and MRIs. Mm. And he said, I can tell on the MRIs, it was MRIs, when someone's on blood thinner and has AFib, mm. looking at the, the basal ganglia. Huh. And he said, I see little micro hemorrhages. Wow. So he came over and had the mini maze about two years ago because he said, I don't want to take blood thinners. And I don't want to be on stuff like amiodarone. Wow. He had, he had intermittent AFib. So I throw that in there just to and stimulate people. If you have a question, uh, get on the phone and get it in. Uh, 37607 on the phone for a text, and you'd text it to DeBakey. <clears throat> Put in the little text box, DeBakey, D-E-B-A-K-E-Y. Or you can go to pollev.com forward slash DeBakey. And we'll keep those on the screen from time to time. So you can see as well, and you can get your questions in while we continue here uh, with Richard. So, Richard, you had a fib, uh, cardioversion, controlled with uh, amiodarone, but like a lot of people with a fib, if the a fib doesn't kill them, the drugs do. Uh, and I learned that after many years, people said, "Gosh, I feel ten years younger now that I'm back in rhythm." And I thought, "Wow, really?" But half of it was getting back in rhythm, and the other half was getting off all these medications. A lot of people were so tired that they just were done at noon on the couch. So I'll take it back to you, shorten it a little bit, get us up to over the next couple of years. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, uh, I had one bright note after the uh, becoming uh, free of AFib for that short time. In, in July of thir- 2013, uh, FAA issued me a special uh, authorization, uh, but it was uh, the highest they would get was a second class medical. So I, and I, I was pretty much decided uh, on retirement from flying anyway at that point. But then, uh, of July of 2014, things came to a real head, uh, 
and like I was mentioning, my cardiologist had me run, go in for these thyroid tests. Make a long story short, I had large thyroid nodules forming. Uh, they uh, recommended that I have a fine needle biopsy done. I did, and they d the uh, the endocrinologist uh, that did the fine needle biopsy also felt like that I had a real toxicity problem because of the amiodarone uh, with my thyroid, and I think it was 100% correct assumption that that's what caused all my thyroid problems because thyroid's the only organ, I think, in your body that uh, really has much of an uptake of iodine. Uh, amiodarone happens to load you up with probably over a hundred or more times the daily amount of iodine that you should take. So it literally destroyed my thyroid. I'll always be convinced of that. So I had a thyroidectomy uh, in 2014. It was very successful. Uh, no problems with that. They saved my parathyroid glands, but sometimes that doesn't always happen. But I uh, got my thyroid taken care of, and the uh, the uh, pathology on that indicated that the uh, the papillary cancer was so small and so uh, uh, had such good margins that uh, I would need no further uh, uh, worry about the cancer. So I went on. Uh, uh, of course, my cardiologist explained to me about, he didn't know about the mini maze. He, he knew there was a, 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 the wolf mini maze. I'd never heard of it. He, he told me, I said, what are my options to get rid of this and get rid of these drugs? And he said, well, possibly uh, catheter ablations. Uh, you could, but I researched that and uh, uh, I don't know it. It's probably a poor way to describe it, but that almost seemed like playing a dark game in the dark or with a blindfold. Wow. Uh, so I thought I may have to do that, but let me get, just give me a little short time to think about it. So I got on the internet and I did something different. I didn't search for treatment of AFib. I put the word of cure in there multiple times with AFib. And it was really, truly a miracle. First time that I tried this search, I came up with uh, Dr. Randall Wolf, Wolf Mini Maze, Houston, Texas. And I made a call, telephone call, talked to uh, the lady that arranges uh, appointments and the surgeries. And, she said, first thing, you need to send in all your information. She told me what information they needed and some medical records to see if you're a candidate. And uh, I sent everything in. I got a confirmation. Then, uh, oh, a week or so after that, I got another phone call from her. She said, uh, the doctor is across town today doing surgeries. And it'll be late this afternoon, maybe six-ish before he gets back to the office, but he's going to review your uh, information, and then he'll be getting back with you. And, uh, of course, I thought, well, it'll be, that'll, that's great. I, 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 in my mind, I looked forward to hearing someone from the office call me because I thought, I'm sure the doctor's going to be calling me on the phone about this. Well, a few, uh, two days later, I got a phone call, which I missed because I was in seeing my final visit to the endocrinologist. My wife took the phone call because she had my cell phone and told, said, uh, can he call you back? She said, someone called and I think it was actually Dr. Wolf and so when we went out into the car or where it would be quiet before we left, I was anxious to call. I called, but I made me a little, uh, I was being much more quick and succinct than I am now. 
probably. I made a little short checklist of things I wanted to ask and talk to him about because I knew if I had a surgeon on the phone that was that busy and everything that I'd probably have about two minutes to take care of everything. Well, Dr. Wolf uh, is a very uh, secure person and and his, he, he has no insecurities about his knowledge or ability, and he's got very little ego, which is amazing for his talents. He talked to me. He actually kept me on the phone for almost 40 minutes. Well, I, Ask, you know, I don't remember that. I, I should have billed you more. <laughs> I think we underbilled you. That's why I didn't mention it until now. <laughs> <laughs> Let me let me interrupt you again, um, because you talked about you asked if you would be a candidate or not, and that's one of the topics we wanted to cover today. And I do have a screen up that I'd like to show briefly on candidates for the mini maze, because these are common questions that come up. Uh, first of all, people say, "Well, what if I'm out of rhythm all the time?" Versus in and out, uh, in rhythm, but once in a while I have AFib. The mini maze works on any type of AFib, whether it's what they call paroxysmal time to time versus long standing, persistent, or permanent, where the patient is out of rhythm all the time. So it doesn't matter what type of AFib it is. People say, What if I've had a previous ablation? Yes, we've done many patients, probably. I'd say half the patients have had previous ablation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at least, and uh, some, as many, believe it or not, six ablations, and we've still been successful with the mini maze approach. People call and they say, I've had a stroke. Uh, one of my good friends, he was my uh, anatomy partner in medical school, school, called me and said, I had a stroke, and they found out that I have an arrhythmia. Mm. Uh, and he's now, he came to Houston and had the mini maze. But a stroke does not prevent someone from having the mini maze procedure. A very common situation is people who cannot take blood thinners, any blood thinners, because of bleeding from the gastrointestinal tract called GI bleeding or nose bleeds. And again, the mini maze is a good solution because we don't use blood thinners after the procedure. And then finally, people will say, well, I've failed amiodarone or flecainide or sodalol or ticosin, could we still have the mini maze? The answer is yes. So those are some of the common questions we get from people wanting to know if they might be candidates uh, for the procedure. If you have a specific question, get on your phone and uh, text the message. It's uh, to 37607 and in the little text box put to Bakey. Or if you're on your computer, go to pollev.com forward slash debakey and type in your question, and we'll try to get to you before the end of this uh, hour. Uh, Swami, your, any uh, comments so far? No, I'm still just enthralled with um, our patient's story, so I'm you know, excited to hear about the rest. The, uh, and by the way, amiodarone is about 30% Iodine, Richard, you're absolutely correct. <clears throat> a lot of people don't know that, but it's a big molecule. And in the center of that molecule is an I for iodine. Um, and that's why you get all these adverse uh, effects that are consistent with uh, iodine toxicity. Amiodarone is 30% iodine. There's another drug called Maltac. And what they did with Maltac is try to make the same molecule, but without the I in the middle. And they were successful in doing that. The only problem is, in my opinion, it doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. But that's what Maltac is. It's the amiodarone without the I in the middle. Mm. Richard, you're back on. Finish your story. Okay, I'll uh, try to move it along just a little bit faster. <laughs> but the, uh, during that telephone conversation with you, and you were, it was 40 minutes. I was absolutely amazed. And mainly it was you opening up the door for questions from me. And you answered every single question that I had. But before that, I, before I talked to you, I did manage to, at, the, at that point, the video 
of you performing a complete procedure from beginning to end was not on the normal consumers type website. It was, I, I dug and managed to figure out a way to get on to a medical, mainly for medical professionals, yeah. managed to download your video. I watched it from beginning to end, and then I studied and learned to, tried to learn as much as I could about every piece of that procedure. I was very, I had my mind made up before you ever called me that I was ready to do it. You said, when would you, you said, how soon would you like to do it? I said, in the morning. <laughs> and you said, well, that wouldn't be possible, but I think I can maybe uh, get you in fairly soon. But he, but you said, and it really was impressive to me, you said, now this is a serious issue. It's something for you and your wife to think about. You don't need to be in a rush, and I'm I I I, I don't uh, I'm not trying to get you to do it so quickly. And I said, no, no, you don't understand. I've made my mind up. I want it done as soon as I could. And I was in your office about within about ten days or two weeks, and uh, there was no. That's very obvious. There's no hard sell there. You're you're doing this for all the right reasons. And I was very comfortable with that. That meant, that really meant something to me. When you told me, don't rush into this, just give yourself a little while to think about it. I didn't need any time to think about it because I had very few other alternatives. And I was uh, wanting to get out off of the blood thinners, the blood thinner I, uh, that I was on, uh, was one of the least problem causing ones, so almost no side effects, does a great job. The only thing is it's got about a 10 day half life and uh, you sure don't want to have a bleed or an auto accident or what have you on that drug because it's not like uh, some of the other drug thinners where they can shoot you up with some vitamin K and in a few hours have you on doing brain surgery on you or something. I lost my close, one of my closest friends. Oh, now Richard, uh, just, Richard, you are about, you're over four years out from your procedure, right? You're almost over, five. Almost five years. Have you been on blood thinners since your procedure? No, and that was one of the thing. I knew the danger of being, it was the only blood thinner that didn't bother my stomach or upset me. It did a great job of thinning my blood without any side effects, except the fact that if you're injured, like I say, I lost just six or eight months ago when my closest friends fell, hit the back of his head, was rushed to the best neurological center in Oklahoma. He died because of the same blood thinner that he was on. He was on the same thing. The doctor said that I can save him, but I can't, I'll have to operate to do it. And I can't, can't I stop can't, the bleeding. I can't use the time that it takes to get this down to, he said, even at a minimal amount of doing it even half the time, he said, it will probably, he'll probably never get off the operating table because of the blood thinner. Now, Richard, so let, I, me, let me throw in a few questions. I don't want people to wait too long for their questions. Let's go with a couple here. Uh, first question from our audience, people mentioned triggers. I've tried to find out mine, so I can just be sitting and go into AFib. Why? What causes the heart to do this? Well, if you interview 50 people, you'll get about 50 triggers. Uh, but I believe, and, there, and, and by the way, this is research that I did with the uh, University of Oklahoma uh, in Oklahoma City, was I believe that the, most people start out with what's called vagal AFib. That means there's nothing really wrong with your heart. You have an autonomic imbalance. There are tiny nerves that are all around the heart. And guess where they are the most? Right around the pulmonary veins where ablation is done. <coughs> but I'm not the only one. There's a, there are a group of us that feel that AFib is caused by this imbalance of these autonomic nerves. So the treatment should not be to see how much of the heart you can destroy which by the way, once it's destroyed, never comes back, but treat the nerve problem on the outside of the heart and you'll have better results. 
Uh, so that's what we do. So the trigger lots of times are things that trigger these autonomic nerves. These are the nerves that make your hands sweat when you go on top of a tall building and look over the edge. These are the nerves that make your heart rate go uh, or increase when you're watching a scary movie. Why should your heart rate increase? You're just sitting there. You're not exercising. So what, can, what are triggers? A, a stress is a common trigger. I believe stress is a very important trigger for AFib. There's probably a hereditary component too, but if you have that hereditary disposition and then you get in very stressful situations, that could do it. Um, some people say it's alcohol, some say it's coffee. Our goal after the mini maze is to make it so if you want a cup of coffee, you can have it. If you want a glass of wine at dinner, you can have it. Because after all, the goal of the therapy should be to allow you to get back to the kind of life that you'd like to live. So you don't have to take blood thinners all the time, so you're not tired at noontime, and you can do the things you want to do. But I think in general, people come up with all types of triggers. But I just talked to a, a wonderful man yesterday. He's an attorney here in, in Houston, and he said, I thought the trigger was... The coffee, I stopped drinking coffee. I love coffee. I thought the trigger was wine, so I stopped drinking wine. I love to have a glass of wine, but I still get it. <laughs> so as far as the triggers are concerned, I think the most common one is stress, but it's anything in your particular body that causes those autonomic nerves to fire erratically. What do you think about that? I, I agree. I think it's an autonomic uh, nervous system imbalance and... and um, you know, Dr. Wolf and I are, are still from the generation of cardiac surgeons that trained in general surgery before we learned cardiac surgery. And uh, when we would have patients who, from an abdominal source, uh, bad appendicitis or a perforated colon or something like that, would get very sick and get very septic, uh, we talk about how they have a, a massive SERS response or systemic systemic inflammatory response, which is. In, in some ways very similar to a, a massive autonomic surge. And, uh, you know, so one of the harbingers of doom, you know, for those patients, um, you know, when you still didn't quite know what was going on, you're still trying to figure out the diagnosis, let's say they had a small bowel obstruction or something like that, is if they go into AFib. Uh, because you knew that if they didn't have a history of AFib and then they went into AFib, that something really bad is happening in the body. Yeah. Um, something is stirring up all of this inflammation. Something is stirring up all of this this sympathetic uh, nervous system response. So I think you know that's the you know, maybe a different cause. Mm -hmm. You know, in those situations, more yeah. of a temporary cause. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it follows that same sort of pathway, um, and that's how I've always kind of you know conceived of it. We also we to, know this, and this was a study we did at, at your old place at Texas Heart. Mm -hmm. We went back and looked at a large series of patients who had heart transplants. And the audience may not know this, but after regular heart surgery, the incidence of new AFib right. is quite high. Right. In coronary surgery, it's anywhere from 15 to 35 percent. In aortic surgery, in a lot of places, it's 50 percent. So in other words, the patients never had AFib, they have open heart surgery, after surgery, they got AFib. Right. So we thought, I thought, well, let's see what it is in people who've had a transplant. That's a major heart operation. You're getting a new heart. So you might think the incidence of AFib would be quite high. You know what it was, Richard? 2%. Why? Because those hearts are denervated. It's a transplanted right. heart. All those autonomic nerves have been transected. But you've already virtually had an ablation. <laughs> right. Uh, right. You've got a denervated heart. Let's go to another Never question. Connected. we got a couple here. Uh, can the mini maze be done for other arrhythmias in AFib? For example, SVT, which is uh, uh, supraventricular tachycardia, non-SVTs, et cetera. Uh, excellent question. There is one other. There are two other arrhythmias that the mini maze works. Uh, one is called IST, uh, which is a common problem where you have a tachycardia, but it's not AFib. It's a regular heart rate, but it's too fast, usually from 100 to 150. Uh, so it's called inappropriate sinus tachycardia, or IST. 
and the right side of the mini mace takes care of IST with some modifications. So if you're 20 to 40 year old lady that has an elevated heart rate and it won't go down, it's probably IST and the mini maze on the right side will take care of that. The other thing is atypical flutter or called left atrial flutter, commonly seen after ablations, very common, very hard to treat. A mini maze will stop atypical left atrial flutter in most cases. Um, so we've got a couple more questions, but we'll go back up because I want to finish your story. Uh, wrap up and tell us you had the mini maze almost five years ago. Uh, I assume then you got off your medications and we, we didn't give you any blood thinners. And I'm, I assume maybe you started feeling better too. Well, very definitely. I, I felt like a new person. Of course, just being in the hospital that short time, uh, I didn't realize, you know, and you, you told me I could start running again in six weeks, which I did. And it was a little like starting over, but it, I, everything came back. The heart worked perfect. I got my stamina back. The uh, I wanted to mention that people that are entertaining having this done need to, two things that really impressed me and gave me confidence with the mini maze. One was the fact that uh, that left atrial appendage was ligated. Yep, that's a big one. That's a big one because I'm a believe. I believe the studies are true that, that say that a big percentage of the blood clots come from the blood that's pooled in that appendage. Mm -hmm. Yep. The other thing, I was very, very, very. Uh, I have an engineering background too, uh, and it made sense to me that when you did your ablation with your RF clamp uh, on the atrium. One, the way that that ablation was controlled power-wise. Yeah, it's very safe, very safe. It was very automated and there was no way you were going to burn a hole in my heart yeah. and then have to be open on the operating table immediately. Right, well, you're right. Well, much better about that, but the thing that really was impressive was you using the uh, probes, and you had a ten or so spots which you yeah. probed where you knew that were the likely spots. You could read the electrical current on those uh, pulmonary veins. You could go down onto the atrium, and you could find the spots. Sure enough, yeah, it's going down, coming in on the vein. Here it is. And when you did your ablation, you didn't just close me right back up. You get your, your little tool out before you do that, and you check, yep, those electric currents, they're still there on that pulmonary vein. And you went down to those eight or 10 spots on my atrium. Nope, it's not there anymore. We've got a good skull. Yeah. And then you had a solution. If, if, if it needed a little more, you could do it then. Yep, you're right. Uh, and that's, that's exactly what Swami and I did today. Yep. Uh, same sort of thing, and we make sure that everything's isolated by the end of the procedure. Um, run in, let's get a couple more questions in here. I've been in permanent AFib for three years. That means continuous AFib. It says due to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Myopathy. Do you think I would be a good candidate for the mini maze procedure? Well, we have done patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this is where a part of the muscle of the heart is hypertrophied. And it can cause some blockage of the blood leaving the heart. A lot of times it doesn't. Uh, but we have successfully done the mini maze in people that have been out of rhythm more than three years and in people that have had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So the short answer is yes, we have uh, been able to do that. Um, another question. Uh, thank you for having me. My question is, are the lungs deflated during the procedure? Uh, sort of. And the way I explain it is what we do is we preferentially breathe one lung over the other. We don't stick a needle in the lung. The lung's not a balloon and deflate it. We don't do that. What we do is we have a special tube. The, it's a breathing tube that will breathe one lung over the other. So we can deflate one lung a little bit so we can see the heart sac, and then we can deflate the other one a little bit. But when we say deflate, really all we're doing is we're not ventilating it. So that is a term that's used commonly, deflate. 
but it's not like a balloon. All we're doing is we're preferentially breathing one lung over the other. Does that make sense, or yeah. how would you yeah. say it? No, I would, I would say it the, the exact same way. It's, it's when we're operating on the right side, we make sure that the right lung is, is out of the way, and it's mostly not, um, you know, it's not having deflation. air. It's it, just, you don't breathe it. It's just, it's just yeah. right. It's just, it, there's no, there's no real, there's a, a, there is a, a very minimal amount of air that's moving in and out of the right lung. Yeah. And so the left lung is basically doing all the work. And that allows us, um, you know, the opportunity to basically see what we need to do and, and, and work. Um, and sometimes we, we partially inflate the right lung if we need to, yeah. you know, um, uh, during the, the, and then we do the same thing on the left side. So it's basically I've, the same. I've been doing this for 16 years. Plus, I evolved this procedure from the lung work I did. Right. Uh, taking out a part of the lung for lung cancer or for uh, um, emphysema. It, it's the same technique. And it works fine, and there's no downside to it at all. Uh, but but it's a common question. Uh, Richard, back to you. Um, finish your story for us. Okay, I want to just mention uh, what really turned out to me to be one reason I have so much confidence that I'm going to be one of these people that this uh, sticks for me and that I'm cured of AFib. Uh, on... Uh, November of 2016, the FAA, the Civil Aviation Institute of Medical Technology, which are a very thorough bunch of guys. They have big panels meet and they have experts from all the medical fields. They determined that after I had asked for a medical there in 2016, they decided that I could be issued a normal FAA medical, not a special issue, and that from that point on, I was considered cured of AFib, not treating AFib to their standards, but cured. So I think I was probably the first pilot to receive a normal medical after being cured of AFib. That meant a whole lot to me, even That's though amazing. I don't really have a big requirement for that medical now. And the only drug I take, other than some vitamins and things, D3, I take uh, my uh, Synthyroid since I don't have a thyroid and I'm having no problems with my thyroid levels. So I take one, and that's pretty good. Uh, it makes me feel pretty good at 75 to be taking one pill that's... Uh, that's fantastic. That's now I put up on the screen um, a slide for people who are interested in <clears throat> the procedure, the technique, and it says wolfminimaze.com. Uh, this website uh, was started by a skydiver who uh, had the mini maze procedure about 15 years ago. At the time, we called the procedure bilateral antral uh, afib ablation and closure of the left atrial appendage. And he said, nobody's ever going to come <laughs> see you for that. And he's probably right, George Rave. And he came to me at Christmas. And he said, uh, Doc, I got a Christmas present for you. And I said, George, you're in rhythm. That's good enough for me. George says, no, I, I, you need a website. And I said, okay, well, let's, uh, let's sit down and talk about it. And he goes, no, Doc, you don't understand. It's already done. And he <clears throat> opened up his computer, and there, there it was, Wolf Mini Maze. So he's the one that named it, uh, the procedure. Uh, and that's how it got its name. And the website has gone through several iterations since then. But... It's been a really good source for people to find out the procedure. The procedure is on there, as well as testimonials and other questions are answered about AFib. <clears throat> so I encourage you to go to wolfminimaze.com. And below that, if you're interested in a virtual or in-person consultation, that phone number there can be used. That's a direct number uh, to our site, 713 
441-9342. That's Kimberly's number, Kimberly Martinez, who is our RN who takes care of the arrhythmia patients. So you can, uh, we do a lot of virtual visits, no matter where you are in the country, we can uh, do a virtual visit. Or if you're in the area and you want an in-person consultation, that's fine as well. Uh, I think, I guess we can go to one last question. What about a heart with AFib, PVCs, and SVT? Okay, so essentially what, what the uh, person is asking, okay, I've been diagnosed with AFib, but I also have extra beats from the lower part of the heart mm -hmm. called BB, PVCs, premature ventricular contractions. AFib is in the top two chambers. PVCs are extra beats from the lower two chambers. And this is not unusual. We see patients oftentimes that have mixed arrhythmias, but their prominent arrhythmia is usually the AFib. The PVCs in and of themselves are generally treated medically, and usually if you can treat the AFib, get the patient back in rhythm, they can tolerate the PVCs pretty well. If the PVCs are a real problem, there is also a catheter ablation procedure for the PVCs. The mini maze will not treat arrhythmias of the lower part of the heart, so it will not treat the PVCs. Anything to add to that? No, I think that's, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah, it's, this is for the upper yep. chambers, but it's not unusual to have more than one arrhythmia, but usually the AFib is the one that you really need to take care of. And then I think sometimes just getting the AFib under control sometimes tends to help with the PVCs and, and everything else because the, it, it creates this sort of arrhythmogenic uh, situation you know, well, you're in, right. in the heart. That's um, a good point. You know, and, and so you know, uh, that's a kind of added benefit. In AFib, sometimes the valves are not in sync right. because the rhythm is irregular. And that's hard on your left ventricle, and that can lead to PVCs. PVCs You're yep. right. You're right. Um, we've tried to take care of most of the questions. Uh, we've put on the screen a way to contact us if you're interested in more information or a virtual visit, or if you want to go to the website. Uh, Richard, it's been great having you on. Any more closing comments before we shut this baby down? Uh, just like to apologize for not being a little more succinct but i'm very excited about this and what it's done for me and the journey that i had with afib and uh, like i say i felt like that was putting a gold star on the whole ending of the thing with the faa giving me uh a cured yeah uh, uh essentially a, a, essentially unrestricted license i guess you'd call it in lay terms. Yes, yep. I, I do have, uh, when I take my medical, if I take, if I renew my medical, the uh, normal out in the field aviation medical exam, examiner is able to do mine and because they can sign off on my thyroid condition as long as they just have a within a certain length of time yeah. a, a report, of a, a lab report on my thyroid levels. And as, and and as you know, and we've discussed, um, the mini maze is a favored procedure by people that fly planes, by pilots, because they don't want to be on medicines and they want to get a clear physical and it's their livelihood. Uh, also, I can tell you're an aviator because you have all the dates written down. I'm surprised you didn't give us the time of day. You have such a great memory for all the minutia. It's amazing. Uh, so you still got it, Richard. I just wanted to say, so so I guess if you're out there and you have AFib and you're a pilot, come see, uh, you know, your other flight surgeon here, you know, <laughs> Dr. Wolf, you know, get you back, uh, get you back flying. He's a true maverick and pioneer in AFib, uh, you know, yeah. so uh, there we go. Well, if, if anyone has a, a question for me, anybody that has been in on this and would like to send me an email and give me their phone number and a little uh, idea of what they're uh, interested in finding out, I'd be happy to return a phone call to them, but I can give you my email address. Well, Richard, uh, Richard, Mr. Producer here says email is okay. Uh, you may give out your email right now if you'd like. 
Okay. Anyone that would have a question, I'd be more than glad to uh, respond to it. Uh, email 73170 at cox, C-O-X dot net. 73170 at cox dot net. And then I'll get back to you and, and send and give send me your phone number and I'll call you back and we can talk about this because uh, uh, it it really uh, made a big difference in my life. Give the email one more time, please. Seven three one seven zero at cox c o x dot net. Richard, thanks so much. Uh, say hi to Linda for me. I look forward to her uh, artwork. It's it's amazing. I see one of her things in the background there. That zebra. She did that, didn't she? Yes. Well, yeah. we've that. That's one of the small pieces. She's oh, got. Uh, she works on just, five uh, foot pieces, doesn't she? Oh, some right. of them. Uh, there's one in the health center for the Choctaw tribe that's absolutely amazing. I think it's probably about nine feet uh, tall, eight or nine feet tall, and about seven feet wide. Well, tell her I Is said it? hello. Thank you for joining us, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this concludes another episode of DeBakey CV Live. April Fibrillation, Swami, thanks for joining us. Thank you, always a pleasure. And of course, uh, thanks to uh, our fearless leader, Dr. Lumsden, who really set, uh, is responsible for this whole studio in setting up the Bakey CV Live. And we'll be back again in a month, first Tuesday of April, uh, and it will be at uh, 5 p.m. Central Time. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Well, thank you for the invite, uh, Dr. Wolf, and it's a pleasure to meet your uh, Associate. other doctor there working with you. I'd like to meet him in person sometime. Take care. Look forward to that. Take care.